Welcome everyone, Costine here with a discussion about the Nurgle rework in Total War Warhammer 3, Thrones of Decay, patch 5.0. This is covering the free DLC part of the patch. It is not including anything that is paid. So everyone is going to have access to what I'm about to show in this video. And I've been playing this campaign as Kugaf, and I got all the way over here to Volskrad. I am faction strength rank 4, and yes, my reputation is very low, mistakes were made, uh, I'll explain that in just a moment, but I just came over here, I saw that, okay, Azazel had wiped out Kislev, so I was like, okay, let me go to war with Azazel. It's not the first time I've seen Azazel take over Kislev, but Archeon? Rarely see him this far in. So what exactly is going on here? What the hell have I walked into? Four armies? Five? <laughs> I've never seen five armies from any of the Warriors of Chaos. Like, I've played a lot of campaigns in this game. Fr five freaking full stacks of Warriors of Chaos units. Jeez. What strength ranking is this guy? You oh. To be <laughs> so, Azazel is uh, apparently triggered the Warriors of Chaos in the game crisis. Wolfric is tagging along with two, two and a half stacks. More like close to five stacks. Carl Franz is fighting all of it on its own, and Elspeth hasn't killed Vlad yet, so good job, Elspeth. Really great job, and yeah, Kislev has fallen to Archeon. This is a interesting situation, as Garsnik is alive, and for, so is Forgrim, though he's lost his capital. <laughs> Things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. But then again, who am I to judge? Because I spent a lot of this campaign trying to vassalize Drazov, and then it's like I said, screw it. Let me vassalize Grimgore. Like, I wanted to vassalize Drazov. It would have worked better in some ways, but it's like, okay, I'll sell for Grimgore. It's, yeah, we sell for Grimgore. Mind you, this was after I spent dozens of turns fighting Grimgore's freaking armies, destroying, pulverizing them before I turned against Drazov. That's the reason my reputation is so low. Because Drazov didn't want to vassalize. I was like, okay, bastard. I can vassalize Grimgore with your blood as tribute. So I'm going to go for it. Yes, Nurgle does have diplomatic vassalization. It's always had diplomatic vassalization. So what has changed? I'll talk about Kugaf specific stuff, but let's start with plagues. Welcome to the new plague meter. So the location of various things is going to be randomized uh, every couple of turns. So uh, it says here like um, one um, number of plagues until new blessed symptoms and symptom location. So when you create a certain number of plagues, you're going to change the location. Like actually I can create a plague right now. So the way you go with plagues, you'll start with like thing. Uh, you'll you'll start with casualty replenishment and being able to cause enemy attrition. So who knows? Maybe Nurgle has a better plague than Skaven, and you can link various symptoms together, and then you can increase the chance uh, the the spread chance. I'd strongly recommend taking advantage of this one. Uh, you can increase the plague duration. I don't want to go over 400 over here and then you select the target either a settlement or an army where do i want to use it let's go with zarnagrund because yes i do control zarnagrund over there and yeah let me uh increase that yeah, i can go with 400 revive and now um and now, like, these, uh, the ones that I used are going to have a cooldown. The locations do change every so often. And you get Blessed Symptoms. So what Blessed Symptoms do is they have a greater effect. So, for instance, you can get 30% upkeep benefit with a Plague. Now, Plagues have positive effects for your armies and settlements. So, like, construction cost, upkeep, income growth, corruption, etc, etc, and you can spray plague. Like, being able to increase the chance of a plague by quite a lot is, as you might imagine it, a very, very useful ability. So I can get 
a 70% chance over here through the plague itself. So this is how plagues work right now. Uh, things like campaign movement range, disabling march. So you can really make plagues work. You still have uh, you still have uh, cultists in uh, in a campaign. So if I wanted to unleash a plague on an uh, on a settlement or on an enemy faction, uh, then I can just uh, summon a cultist. There he is, and then unleash that. And with a high enough chance, if you spend infection, so. At this point, a plague like all over, like a plague can cost quite a bit, right? Dependent on what you're using. So each modification is 50. Uh, then if we take that away, uh, then if we take that away, a plague is generally going to be 200. But obviously, you can increase this quite substantially. Um, immunity. So both you and the no, actually, the enemy can get plague immunity. So after the plague expires, there's a couple of turns duration when they're going to be immune to new plagues. So you just can't plague the entire map. But you can certainly spread plagues around on your settlements. So for instance, over here, I have a plague that's increasing my income by 20%. Sometimes you will get less than optimal symptoms. So for instance, I would not have wanted to go melee defense. But yeah, 20%... Income, recruitment, health. That's how plagues work right now. Another thing to mention is unholy manifestations. These haven't changed as best as I can tell. But what has changed is the fact that there's three Nurgle legendary lords in a campaign right now. So you're going to see more Nurgle corruption across the world, at least early on. Like You can almost always expect to get Blessing of Nurgle. As for exponential growth, you're going to have to work on that. Now, in this campaign, Tamarcon and uh, Epidemius have been wiped out, so I'm the only one that's spreading Nurgle's uh, love. And oh boy, is there love, Lokir and Grimgor. Gelt, I, I did wipe him out. Uh, Gelt allied with Xiao Ming makes Cafe tricky. So that's with plagues. Let's go over into settlements. Settlement wise, first off, let's start with the commandments. Uh, not quite sure exactly what they've changed, but I'm pretty certain that some things are a bit different. I mean, at least one thing is certainly a bit different. So you get Foster Cults, which gives 10 infections and increases corruption. You get Plague God's, God's Pasture, which increases plague duration and chance of plague spreading. Rush Cycle Cost, so you can rush the cycle of military buildings with infections. That's how those work. And um, play God's nursery for control and growth. In terms of resource buildings, uh, it, they have different effects now. So for medicinal plants, you get an increase in plague uh, duration and chance of plague spreading. In terms of wood, you get a cycle time benefit for military buildings and a construction cost, 20% for military buildings. Uh, for things like... Um, for many of them, there is a chance of plague spreading, but there are different effects. Uh, for things like dyes, you get income and hero recruit rank in the local province. So that's what resource buildings uh, do. But what else has changed? So the military buildings that we have over here have stayed the same in for the most part. So you build one at tier one. It takes four turns to build one or an advanced military building it takes six turns to build it one and then it goes through the cycle now you can speed this cycle up using infections and these buildings cost infections to build now the using infections for the sake of rushing construction or rushing the cycle so you can get higher and higher tier units can be beneficial but it means you're going to be using infections for various things you're obviously going to use them for plagues. You're going to use them for military buildings. Uh, there's an argument to be made that you don't necessarily need as many military buildings because if you can rush uh, the cycle over and over and over again, you can get all the units you can, and you can instead focus on other structures as well. 
So like the effect of the buildings, right? They no longer provide any income or anything like that. They just give you these units to uh, to recruit over there. It, and this ties nicely into uh, corruption. So Nurgle corruption gives you growth, reduces the recruitment cost if it's at 100 by 50%, rec increases the recruitment health by 30% for all units in province and increases chance to spread the plague. You do have, I believe this wasn't the case before, but you do have growth on the main settlement buildings starting at 10 going all the way to 50 for a tier five building. So that's how the military buildings work. Hero capacity wise, hero capacity is now increased through the garrison buildings. So melee heroes, based, uh, like the melee heroes, the cultist and the exalted hero Nurgle can gain from the uh, festering pit hall of hosts. So you can get powerful, more powerful garrisons. Capacity increases at tier three. Uh, for casters, I don't have the DLC over here, um, but for like the plague ridden, uh, you get uh, the warp stone traps over there, which also increases uh, Nurgle, uh, Nurgle corruption and the problem. So you can get a decent amount of hero capacity, but keep in mind, obviously, you do want military buildings. But you don't just necessarily want military buildings. Like over here, I do have four military buildings, but there's an argument to be made that having fewer military buildings and rely on infections can be more beneficial. In terms of economic buildings, what works differently is that you now have a building that gives you infections up to 25 at tier 3 and control. Your main economic building goes up to 600 by default, so 450 at tier 3, 600 at tier 4. And if you have more than 200 growth in a province or with 5 population surplus, you get plus 250 income at tier four, 150. So you can generate up to 600 income at tier three, 850 at tier four. That's pretty solid. Uh, you may want to get growth buildings though, to be fair, like once you get the settlements, like over here, I have 280, um, 80 growth. And, and the ports that Nurgle has are not generating growth. They generate infections. They don't generate uh, growth. But I do think I have, yeah. So I do have the Sea Dragon Steve. But even without that, I would still be over 200. So over here, you can see that this is 850. So I'm generating tons of money over there. I mean, granted, a lot of it is also because I have that plague for the income. So I'm generating plus 80% income. So yeah, generating 8k from a province is uh, pretty dang powerful uh, from a, pers a perspective. I'm using this province as uh, a benchmark because you can get construction cost benefits of wood is giving that. So I'm just trying to show the cost. So there's also research to help with that. You have a growth building that goes all the way to tier five. And when you have high growth for that, that increases the Nurgle corruption in adjacent provinces. So it gives you growth, gives you Nurgle corruption. And the final one, the pit gives you recruitment cost and recruitment health for your own unit. So you can reduce recruitment cost by 75% in a province if you get the pit. Or if you get it at tier two, and you can reduce it to 60% with 100 Nurgle Corruption, which is not really that hard to get. So that's how buildings work. Uh, in terms of recruitment, I'll just look at Kugaf over here. Like you can see, I have a ton and a ton of units over here that I can recruit. Keep in mind, this doesn't have 100 Nurgle Corruption. So you will gain some recruitment cost benefit and some recruitment health benefit, even without 100 Corruption. But obviously, if you want to recruit units and without them costing, you know, an arm and a leg, you're going to want to get to 100 corruption. And yes, units, when you do recruit them, they're not recruited at full HP, though you do have good replenishment as Nurgle, uh, because obviously Plague Red didn't give you replenishment. So you have a decent amount of hero capacity, maybe not as much hero capacity, because every resource building could increase hero capacity. But your economy is much more stable, it's significantly better, and you have to worry about two different resources now. I do feel it can be a bit slow at times, or it's taking some getting used to, because you might think, oh, money is really important, but really, infections are actually more important, I think, than cash. So 
view it kind of like the cast dwarf resource system very light you have two resources both of them are very important so infections like i would even start when i'm starting a campaign you might even prioritize getting infections the infection building as opposed to getting the income building or you know split it between them uh Though the first thing I would get in every Nurgle campaign would be a barracks, because it's gonna take four turns to get it. You have like you can get like 19 units with what you start by default in a Nurgle campaign, and then yeah, regiments, renown, heroes, all that. Uh, but I would firmly recommend getting a basic military barracks, specifically the one for Warriors of Chaos, for Chosen of Nurgle, all that. Though you're gonna need the Warriors of Chaos DLC, uh, the Champions of Chaos DLC for that to work. That's gonna bring up a point about. Is it worth playing Nurgle? Uh, if you own the Champions of Chaos DLC, absolutely. Like, I think so. Without it, that's a different discussion that I'm not necessarily going to get into here in great detail. But yeah, I mean, Nurgle, I think, is going to benefit heavily from Thrones of the King, and it's going to benefit quite heavily as well from having Champions of Chaos. Like, but this applies to every Chaos Cap faction. Every Chaos faction benefits immensely from having the DLC. Playing without Champions of Chaos, any Chaos faction is not quite the same. That's just a point worth making over there uh, with respect to that. Uh, beyond that, like that's all there there is with regards to settlements. Units, largely same. Uh, Cost-wise, yeah, they're still expensive to recruit unless you have 100 corruption. There's still a limit, but you can get some really powerful units. Is the economy capable of providing all that you need? Well, I have four armies, pretty decent armies over here. So, but keep in mind, a good, a decent level of my income, four thousand three hundred, is from my vassals of Grimgor and uh, Grimgor, uh, Lokir, and even Rakarf. Though, I basically saved Rakarf from being wiped out over here by Jan Bo. So yeah, I went on a Cafean adventure in this campaign. Uh, you do have Marauders of Nurgle with great weapons. You do have Marauders, regular Marauders of Nurgle. They're pretty solid and durable units. Um, and you're probably going to want to make mixed armies like I have here, like some really good units. Uh, Cast Warriors, I went with Exalted Plague Bearers as well over here for this army. I have a Replenishment Hero. Like, you don't necessarily need to stack all of your armies with Cast Warriors. You probably won't be able to afford that. But yeah, you just get some Cast Warriors because they're really good. You don't have artillery, so... Nah. I mean, obviously, there's a soul grinder, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a bit of an issue still. I mean, you do have Demon Princes of Nurgle, so there is... <laughs> I guess you could consider that uh, your siege uh, vehicle. Kind of. I mean, maybe, somewhat. Not really. Still, I mean, it can... Um, it can work, and it does work. It's not... Uh, it's not horrible, though, yeah, vassalization to get things like uh, repeater bolt throwers can be particularly useful, or general artillery or ranged prowess. I think Tarmarkun is going to do quite well in that respect, considering what we've seen, like, not talking about anything I've played, but just what we saw in that trailer, it's like, he can get dreadquakes based on the trailer. <laughs> that's that's so broken. That is so, And hell cannons, that is so broken. Because Nurgle has genuinely the best melee units, or some of them, or at least not necessarily the best cavalry, he doesn't. But in terms of, like, he has the best chosen with two handed weapons. Like, infantry on infantry, Nurgle wins out against every other faction. Flat out wins out against every other faction in the game. What Warriors of Chaos and Chosen? Uh, cavalry wise, not so much, but you're obviously lacking range and artillery. Nurgle was pretty awful. Like, uh, one of the things to mention, without the Warriors of Chaos, Nurgle was pretty awful. Not quite sure how the balancing would be without that, because, like, obviously, Champions of Castle was the first DLC, and a lot of people should have it by now. It would be pretty, like, would I recommend playing Nurgle without Champions of Cast? Different discussion, right? Okay. So, economy is better, but you do have to balance it out. You gotta be careful. Like, you can certainly outpace your economy in a Nurgle campaign. And one important point, something important that they changed, if you're... If you've got an economy in red, it used to be that as long as you had enough money to end your turn without going bankrupt, that was fine. But now it's changed and you have to worry kind of like two turns. So basically, let's say, okay, so let's say you're at 6,000 gold, you're losing like 3,100, right? Before 5.0. 
it was used to be, okay, end the turn, and I can do whatever actions I want next turn to, you know, just get a couple hundred gold or just a hundred gold to push me over bankruptcy. That would be enough. But now, if you end the turn and you're at 6,000 and you're losing 3,100, next turn you're going to start taking attrition. And that's how it's changed. So, um, if you start, basically, if you start the turn with less gold than... Um, well, less gold than what you're spending, you will immediately start taking attrition. I mean, it's not really going to properly activate for another turn, but just be aware of that. Because, like, one of the things that slowed me down significantly in this campaign, like, this is not a great result in a campaign, though I'm still getting used to Nurgle, so don't necessarily take it as the be all and end all over here. Uh, but one of the things that slowed me down, as opposed to just Draz, if not willing to vassalize, was the fact that I didn't necessarily appreciate that. Because it's not too much of an issue but like Nurgle like Nurgle does earn a lot more money but you still can't trade and your structures still do cost quite a bit so um, let me just look at the more underdeveloped province like Fuhang so getting to tier 5 over here is going to cost me 14,000 that is very very expensive now you don't necessarily need to get that like you can increase your capacity at tier 3 that's not too bad you can get a lot of units in tier L, tier free, but like obviously, like that's where you can get into arguments. Is it worth just you know cycling some buildings in a province that has a tier five settlement and you know getting the higher tier stuff, or is it worth building a bunch of barracks? Probably some combination of the two of them. So that's what settlements units stayed the same, heroes stayed the same, um, the ones that exist. Research heavily inspired by cast dwarfs. So you start with faction and military. There is research that does require you to spend infections. So you're spending infections on buildings, you're spending infections on plagues, and you're spending infections on, on um, research. So you got to be careful. There is a particular research here that does cost like a couple hundred, I think it's 200 infections to get past it. It's not great, really, because, I mean, it is just casualty replenishment, but and unlocks these trees and you know going even further is going to require that you do get one you do get a bunch of useful things like um the nurgling benefit when a plague is spread is over here so you know you're, you may want to unlock that you can get population surplus when you capture a settlement that might be something you want to prioritize you can have 15 infections like over here on this side there's some pretty useful stuff so there might be a benefit to rush over here in this particular tree because you can give you money on this side you get more let's say be military benefits over here like rush cycle cost cycle time lord and hurry recruit rank all that and then yeah military like i would not necessarily prioritize the military stuff early on i would like you can get things can be researched reasonably fast if you will <laughs> though i mean I am 60 turns in in the campaign, but still, like, if you look at a lot of the research, it's like four turns, five turns. Some stuff is obviously six turns and all that, but there's a good amount of stuff that is accessible, especially anything that requires, like, infections is going to be done in a single turn. So if I, you know, start doing that, it would just be five turns to get plague incubation. But yeah, I would probably focus on the left side here because there's a bunch of economic benefits and settlement benefits that you could really use. Where I'd start would be to get Maddening Crowds for control and then get Carcinogenic for the growth and then, yeah, Fetid Corpses um, and then you, yeah, get these two pieces of research for Nurgle Corruption and Magic Item Drop Chance and Casualties because Casualties can give you Infection. You have Post Battle Option for Gold, you have Post Battle Option for Replenishment, you have Post Battle Option for Infections. I'd recommend, if you're not struggling with money at that point, go, always go for infections because they're more valuable. And then, yeah, just pick Nurgle's Plus, maybe Despicable uh, Rivals, and just go on ahead. So that's what research would Nurgle. How do I feel about the race? It is better. Is it my favorite race? No. I, I admit, like, I didn't like Nurgle before. It's certainly, like, I admit there's some adjustment to be made over here. Uh, but um, it's just not, like, my issue with it is that it does take you four turns to build a barracks. Like, just give you an example of a problem. 
you kind of you will have financial issues. Uh, secondly, one of the main strengths that Nurgle does have is va diplomatic vassalization. But the best way to, to achieve that is to build barracks and sell them into a faction. The issue is that your barracks take four turns, so it is difficult to pull it off. And that's annoying, as opposed to other factions that have diplomatic vassalization, where it's far easier, far simpler. It is annoying. I think, like, if you could just construct a barracks in two turns, and then, yeah, the cycle takes four turns and all that. But if I could construct a tier one barracks, even if I have to wait two more turns to actually, you know, get the units, that would be fine, right? So that, that would be my perspective on that. Another thing, for, for Epidemius and Kugaf, uh, Kugaf um, and Epidemius can take mountains. Guess what? And this is where I get into talking about Kugaf's campaign. Is it better? Yes. Is it great? You're surrounded by mountains. And it's not suitable climate. And you have expensive buildings in your campaign. So my answer to that would be no. <laughs> it's still painful. I, of all the climates in the game that I could give Nurgle, and this is the same for Epidemius, um, you, the fact that you have unpleasant mountains... When you start to, when in both two Nurgle campaigns that don't require the DLC Epidemius is, I'm going to cover him in just a second. But when in both of them you're in areas that are surrounded by mountains and you can't take mountains, that is, that just feels like trolling, I'm not going to lie. That is, like what, you need a blanket, Kugaf? What, are you too cold? I mean, you can take freaking frozen. Weirdly enough, the desert, so the other climates that, the, the climates that are com uh, completely uninhabitable are desert and ocean. I guess it makes sense, I suppose, but Ulf one is perfectly fine. I mean, hell, start me on Ulf one, replacing the cargo with Kugaf. That might be a lot more fun than what we got to deal with right here. So that's my perspective on that. Outside of that, is there anything different for Kugaf? Well, um, his skill line does requ it does take longer to unlock. I'm not necessarily certain if there's many substantial changes. Uh, you do get casualty replenishment on chromatic cost for uh, demonic units. You get regeneration for nurgling units. Utterly useless. I mean, it, the upkeep benefit, I mean, it's beneficial for your faction wide, but still. Like, growth per region, uh, Lord of Stench, so great unclean ones. You do get hero capacity for plague ridden, that's nice. And you do have a chance of plague spraying 10% for all future plagues and infection costs. So you can get plagues cheaper and they spread more. Furthermore, you do have that growth benefit, and you do have the recruitment health for all demonic units. Not the mortal units, which are the better ones to actually get. Because, like, yeah, between the mortal units and the demonic units, except, except, like, things like Great Unclean ones and a couple of others, like, if I have to pick between Plague Bearers and Warriors of Chaos, I'm picking Warriors of Chaos every single time, even if they're more expensive. The biggest benefit... Uh, in his campaign, I would say, beyond the fact that he does get an extra Plague Ridden for his skill line, is the fact that you get an additional Blessed Symptom when generating a Plague. So, when you're creating a Plague, right, there's going to be some Blessed Symptoms that have a greater effect. And he gets an extra one. And then, for every 10 hero ranks, you get an extra uh, Blessed Symptom. So the blessed symptoms, you can see which ones are marked. So you can see that there's uh, three of them right um, right here currently active. But keep in mind that uh, uh, three of them currently active in this situation. Right. And maybe it's a bit bugged. I mean, you're supposed to get... I don't know. That That's a bit weird over there. Not quite sure what to make of that. But regardless, that's what Kugav gets. So he will have better plagues than everyone. Somewhat cheaper in some ways because of his skill line. But that's what he has to offer. Outside of that, he's still the same fat bastard that we used to know. I mean, you can benefit from creating plagues on his army because it's cheaper. That's about it. Let me talk about Epidemius and also Epidemius's defeat rate. So welcome to my Epidemius uh, campaign. 
His faction effects is that he gains powerful rewards based on the number of plagues on non-Nurgle factions. He gets cycle time for Plaguefish Poppies. He gets a recruit rank for Plague Bearers of Nurgle and Exalted Plague Bearers of Nurgle. And he gets a 25% campaign movement range for Plague Cultists. Now, I admittedly in this campaign did not handle the, the plagues very well. So you shouldn't take the idea of what I'm about to show. Like, So the fact that I'm at zero plagues on um, other armies is not really how you should play it. Uh, but here's what the effects do. At 1 to 4, you get a research rate and you get Urfather's Blessing, which can spawn a unit of uh, Nurgle and also reduces um, leadership on enemy armies. At... Uh, five, between 5 to 9 plagues, it get, increases research rate, more ability uses, reduce, reduces casualty or replenishment, uh, and leadership further, and also plague aff afflicted on non-Nurgle armies with a plague created by you. At Rampant, between 10 and 19, uh, you get more research rate, you get a unit to spawn in Nurgle, uh, more of his blades ability. I'll cover that in just a second. The plague afflicted gets worse. And finally, at 20 plus, you get 50% research, which can be pretty nice. Urfather's benevolence, which summons a great unclean one, plus free ability uses, damage to self, leadership. So you have the potential of really damaging an enemy with plagues. So Tally of Pestilence. Uh, increases physical resistance, melee, his special skill line increases physical resistance, melee attack. He gets Epidemic Burst, which does explosion damage. You get Ammunition for Exalted Plague Bearers and Plague Drones, upkeep benefits, weapon strength. You get Population Surplus for newly captured settlements. So you can get one from Research, you can have one more from his skill line, so that's pretty useful, not gonna lie. You get recruitment health plus 5% for all demonic units in the army and 10% physical resistance. That's pretty useful for uh, exalted players, but not, not gonna lie, I I still prefer Warriors of Chaos, but I mean, they're trying at least to make Plague Bearers work more. Uh, reducing Plague immunity duration and infections cost to create a Plague faction Y 10%. And then you get an ability that can summon a unit of plague bearers into exalted plague bearers right so i think it starts as regular plague bearers and it goes into exalted plague bearers that's what epidemius does in terms of his quest items he has one that increases in corruption weapon strength bonus of infantry another one that gives you plus 15 with demons of chaos an ability sands of sickness that basically is going to hurt a lot of enemy units you get Wound Recovery Time, Casualty Replenishment, and Upkeep for Nurgle units. You start the campaign over here in the Forest of Decay just south. You control uh, the Forest of Decay and the uh, cliffs, and you just need to take the Tower Flies. You start a war with Siege Faction. Daniel has been moved in Volcanic Heart, basically. He also starts a war with the same Siege Faction. I'd recommend wiping him out. You're, um, also, just, uh, just worth mentioning here, uh, before I mention anything, so you get, yeah, so it's, no, it's Exalted Plague Bearers, you get Regeneration when fighting again, an enemy again, uh, against an enemy with Plague, and Melee Attack plus 5. I really wonder what his defeat rate is. I'm gonna find out soon enough. So you start over here. Now, you do have Malice Dark Blade to the west, but that's not necessarily a problem. Some people that like fellow content creators that also have access to it have said oh it's pretty brutal but yeah but don't fight malice dark blade on turn one he's gonna beat the shit out of you simple as that uh you can get the non-aggression with him on turn one by declaring war on his siege faction so there's two siege factions over here in this area uh the maggot uh can have been moved over here in crocodruck where they start a war with um malachi who got wiped out over here there by trog also, I may have, may or may not have a, had a role in pl uh, that played a part in that. Um, so with uh, 
When Malice Dark played, you can get a non-aggression pact on turn one by just declaring war on his faction, and you can then even get a military alliance if you take the Cliff of Beasts and build a barracks there. Or you could just eventually fight a battle. Like I didn't even get this quest item over there, cause yeah, that quest item. Like, uh, let's talk about that. This is, um, or actually. I did, but then I forgot to save. Uh, something worth mentioning here. This is a legendary, but the Iron Man mode is now disabled by default. This is great because the auto save, the constant auto save, was, was really degrading performance in the campaign, and it didn't quite matter as much. Um, what sucks here a bit with Malice Dark Blade is you need to kill him. I understand Boris Ursus, I understand Malachi, but having to kill Malice Dark Blade as a short campaign victory condition is pretty painful. Especially when you could vassalize him. Like, I wish you should be... Like, I wish... It, um, you could complete this victory condition by vassalizing all of these factions, really. And your long objective is to take Talibayim. I believe there's a particular lore reason for that. Though, interestingly enough, there's a landmark in Known, the Throne of Chaos, and not one in Talibayim, I mean... I haven't really read up on Epidemius' lore. I had read up on Tamarkan's lore. I, I knew about Epidemius, but never really cared too much about his particular character. So that's his campaign. It can be pretty rough if you pick a fight. And hell, even defeating the dwarves. Though, to be honest, Trog will help you out in a significant way over here. Because, like, I mean, Malachi is powerful. Especially if you fight him in a manual battle, but he's kind of one of those legendary lords where his strength is not necessarily reflected in actual battle. As for the playing mechanic, I'm going to be blunt. I think it's going to be really hard getting plus 20 plagues on non-Nurkle armies. Not going to lie on that. Even if you really, really try for it. Like, getting plagues on your own? Sure, no problem. Getting plagues on any... I mean, you do have that Plague Cults, this 25%, you know, campaign movement range, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty brutal. Not gonna lie on that. Not gonna lie at all on that. So, that's Epidemius. I'll now uh, load the campaign as Malice Dark Blade, where I show the defeat trait, and just give my conclusion on Nargal. Or, not necessarily a conclusion, just give you a bit of a perspective, I guess you will. Not trying to do a review here. In terms of Epidemius' defeat trait, he gives you enumerators end. He give that's ten percent research rate and immune to contact effects. I mean, it's not particularly great, though. To be fair, if you do get a bunch of lords with that research rate, you can research things pretty damn quickly, which can be exceptionally useful in a lot of campaigns. But that's what he offers. Not really the best defeat trait, and not really worth the effort I put in here over here to get it. My conclusion on Nurgle, overall, what do I think? Well, there's no conclusion, but do I like it more than before? Have I enjoyed my time more? Um, yeah, I would, I would certainly say that it is a better experience, but let me know what you guys think based on what you've seen. It's not my favorite campaign, but it's certainly no longer the worst race in the game, by far. Like, Nurgle was the worst race in virtually every poll I ever did on the subject. It was considered one of the worst races, or like, at the very bottom, only maybe Tsinch or Ogres being worse than Nurgle. And that's where they were. I think it's better, but let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned for more.